We are grateful to have this opportunity to turn to the scriptures again. If we could, we'll have you to open up your Bibles and turn with us to 2 Chronicles. And we'll look over into the 6th chapter, no doubt refer back some to the 5th chapter as well, where we began last week. We are conducting a little short series here concerning the house of the Lord and the dedication of the temple by Solomon, of course. And we are blessed to be able to look at these things in 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, as you know, is a book that really lists several different revivals or reformations, you might call them wonderful times of renewal for the people of God that are given in the book of Chronicles. And of course, this is one of those times where that uh, was a wonderful uh, set of events that took place that was so encouraging to the people of the Lord in that they were able to see the house of the Lord finished and have it dedicated. And the first act of dedication that Solomon carried out was the act of bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the temple of the Lord. And, of course, that reminds us that you can have all the temple and all the things that are associated with it, all the fine furnishings, the gold, the silver, the things that made Solomon's temple such a wonder of the world at the time, that you can have all of that, but without the presence of God. And, of course, even the Ark of the Covenant itself did not always guarantee God's presence. You remember we studied just recently from the book of Samuel how that they took the Ark of the Covenant out to battle but that didn't guarantee them a victory. They actually lost the Ark of the Covenant itself when they were fighting the Philistines. It was the actual presence of God that made all the difference. Last week we read from 2 Chronicles chapter 5 how that the glory of the Lord came into the temple of God. And I am referring to this series, or I'm titling it, I might say, the, the uh, House of Revival because in this passage concerning the dedication, Solomon really lays out uh, the teaching and the promise of God, how that in any generation, if people wanted to, they could have a measure of revival. He lets them know that in that house, the Word of God, of course, was going to be present. And if they would uh, turn to God and hearken to His Word, that they could have a measure of revival regardless. But we'll look tonight, first of all, Second Chronicles chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. We'll read down through a few verses, and of course we'll make reference to all three of these chapters, chapters 5, 6, and 7 of 2 Chronicles. But if you found your place in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 1, we'll read right there. The Bible says, Then said Solomon, The Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness, but I built a house of habitation for thee in a place of thy dwelling forever. And the king turned his face and blessed the whole congregation of Israel, and all the congregation of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who hath with his hands fulfilled that which he spake with his mouth to my father David, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build a house in, that my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be ruler over my people Israel. But I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name might be there, and have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. For the Lord said to David, my father, for as much as it was in thine heart to build a house for my name, thou didst well, and that it was in thine heart, notwithstanding thou shalt not build the house. By thy son which cometh forth out of thy loins, he shall build thy house for thy name. The Lord therefore hath performed his word that he hath spoken, for I am risen up in the room of my David, my father, and him set on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised, and have built the house uh, for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And in it have I put uh, the ark wherein is the covenant of the Lord that he made with the children of Israel. Brethren, these are majestic passages to say the least in these three chapters because we're able to see something that took place that was promised to David, of course, concerning the fact that his son would sit upon the throne. And then also now it's come to pass what the Lord said concerning David's son, Solomon, that he would build the temple. David, of course, in some ways was uh, just a, an amazing person even as a teenager. By the time he's in his 20s and 30s, it looks like the writings are the history of a superhero. He was an incredible warrior, of course, and worshiper and so many other things. You and I have been talking about how that David really lived his life in capital letters and how that he... Uh, was a person that is uh, very complicated, very flawed, but yet uh, was certainly anointed and used of God. And thinking about David, 
we're reminded that there were times, though, that as it would be with anyone that had so many successes uh, that he had some trouble with pride. <laughs> I mean, our brother's hard uh, sometimes to, um, you know, battle successes. Sometimes people have more trouble with success than they do failure. Yeah. Isn't that right? <laughs> and so uh, he, he ran into some difficulty, came under the judgment of God, and it really could have been worse in some ways, his pride, than it was uh, some of the things that he did, even having to do with Bathsheba, though in some ways you could say that what happened with her came out of pride as well. It was a time when he should be going out to battle. It's peculiar that a person would have a failure like this who's such a warrior, and the time when he should, really should have been out battling is the time when he stayed home, and when he stayed home, he lost a terrible battle. Isn't that right? <laughs> having a brother that reminds us as Christians that... Uh, we need to be ready to continue to take our stand. You can't ever back away from the spiritual warfare that we have as Christians. Amen. Uh, you cannot back off the battlefield. Isn't that true? You can't uh, leave the fact that, you know, you're going to have to take a stand uh, for your uh, spiritual life. What we see is that God will not let David build the temple, even though he had it in his heart to do so, and he got the materials together to see it happen. But God didn't allow it, and we believe it's probably because of this situation with pride, of course. Uh, you know, the, some of the great preachers out of the past, one of the great radio preachers, I wish I could call his name, but he preached a message entitled, uh, David, you can't have everything. <laughs> and uh, God has a way of helping us when it comes to these situations with pride and temptations. I mean, brethren, there's some humility points built all in life if we're willing to pick up on them. Isn't that true? I've learned I never get too far along and get too blessed without something happening that kind of brings me back down to earth. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> but it, uh, the Lord is dealing with David, of course, and dealing with Solomon here. And to review a little bit, as we said last week, that uh, the word house is in this set of passages, these three chapters, 37 times. Think about that, that in 5, 6, and 7, you've got the word house mentioned. 37 times, just in the passage we read last week, it's uh, in there 26 times. And though God, of course, uh, and we'll read the passage that uh, the Bible says that God really uh, cannot live and just be housed in any house made by man, but yet God did allow this place to be dedicated to him and for it to be used for his glory. And it's interesting to see how that a king and dedicated the house of God got on his knees and prayed to the Lord, and of course that let us know that the true king is the God of Israel. Isn't that true? Amen. In the book of Isaiah, the word of God says that came in the year when the king Uzziah died, and Isaiah talks about that, of course, he's the prophet, and he says, uh, came that time whenever the king Uzziah died, uh, but uh, the word of God teaches that uh, God gave Isaiah, a fantastic revelation of himself. He saw the Lord seated in heaven. He saw the glory cloud and the train of his glory fill the whole earth. And the message is, Israel's king is dead, but Israel's God is alive. And he said, amen. amen. And even though those kings would come to the end of themselves, I mean, we serve a God that's never going to come to that place of an end. Can you say amen? amen? We serve an everlasting God, the God who never changes, and his glory uh, remains uh, even though he is, uh, uh, so many things have come against God and his people, and of course we're able to look at uh, how that uh, some of these things developed in this Second Chronicles. And it's good for us to study both Second Chronicles and Second Kings together. Uh, many of the same things are in both books, but they're written from different perspectives. We believe that Jeremiah probably wrote the book of Second Kings, and that he's writing it from that very prophetic type of viewpoint. The book of Chronicles is written more from the priestly viewpoint and having so much to do with the temple and the sacrifices and all that. But it's good for us to see it from both sides. On one side, we kind of get more of the political history from 2 Kings, but here we get uh, the history of the house of God. And all of this is being taught to remind us that God is the same from ages past, that there's never a time when our God will change. And if God will bless people with revival and reformation at a time like that, in that ancient world I've been talking to you about that is on the cusp of the Bronze Age and just coming right into the Iron Age, this is so primitive, so far back that folks were having a difficult time even having an iron sword. This was a long time ago. And of course it amazes us, some of the buildings they were to build, and so we refer to them as being primitive, uh, primitively advanced. Even though they're primitive, 
They were advanced in some ways and could build a temple like this, which blows our mind a little bit like, you know, looking at the pyramids and other buildings around the world built so long ago, we think to ourselves, why in the world did they do that? <laughs> we call them primitive, and then sometimes we think, well, we don't know if we could do what it is that they did back then. But it was an ancient world. It was a time like that. And think about the fact that God could bless and help his people, that he could bring renewal and revival to them, even at a dark time like that, at a time when the nation of Israel was finally just coming together. And uh, King David, in many ways, consolidated it, put the capital in Jerusalem. Had he put the capital anywhere else, uh, people would have thought, you know, that he's for this side of the country or for this tribe or for that tribe. But in the wisdom of God, he went up there and took an area that they had never taken before in the promised land. And he took that new area, that's where the Jebusites were. And the Jebusites were so proud and so arrogant about their ability to hold on to their uh, land and their property there around Zion uh, that they even marched the blind and the lame around the wall saying that uh, nobody can take us. We have such walls and have so fortified that nobody can take our land. Nobody can take this spot. But uh, David and his men, David sent up Joab, of course, and they, they actually took the Jebusites right in the center of Israel, this place uh, that we call Zion and Jerusalem, the hills right outside of Jerusalem, the hills of Zion, the Jebusite area of David took it, and that's where he established Jerusalem in the center and the capital of the nation, and it was done by the wisdom of God and by the will of God. Amen. And by doing so, this caused the nation to be more consolidated. Now they have a standing army. Uh, you know, it came together somewhat under Saul and then under David. And then the Bible teaches that God had planned for a king, even though uh, the way that in which they asked for a king and their motivation, uh, of course, had been uh, dealt with by God, that they wanted to be like the other nations. But we read to you last week, Deuteronomy 17, where the Bible says that when the king sitteth upon the throne, he shall make him a copy of the words of the law. <laughs> I said to you last week that God says when you do have a king, he needs to be a man of the word of God. He needs to have a copy of the law where he's going to meditate day in, uh, day and night. And by doing that, he will be able to rule that nation and direct the country. Amen. Uh, do you think anything has changed along that line, brother? Can we do less for the word of God today and expect to come out well after God commanded them even back then? And even though he's king, he still needs the word. Can you say amen? I mean, you never get so high, so mighty, you never get to a place where you sit so high that you don't need the word of the living God. Can you say amen? Doesn't matter if it's the president, doesn't matter if it's the pastor, it doesn't matter if it's the mayor of town, whoever it is. I mean, oh, brother, you and I, we need a word from God in our lives. Isn't that true? And the Bible just built it right in. The Lord just built this into the, the Israel's future. They said, whenever you have a king, he's going to need to have God's word. It reminds me of Aaron's message that Sunday night with King Josiah back before Christmas. You know, we had Aaron to make his presentation. We had it up on PowerPoint here how that Josiah uh, found that one of those revivals that's recorded in 2 Chronicles, one of those revivals, Josiah is able to discover, some of his men are able to discover it, bring it to him. The scroll, the word of God was lost inside the temple. <laughs> Somehow or another, it seems like there's a real parallel between that and the church today. It's almost as if the Bible has gotten lost in the church. Yeah. Amen. Hello? Amen. <laughs> because it's as if, you know, that uh, so many things that are now debated and questioned could be easily settled if people just believe that the Word of God was in indeed the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Think about all the political questions across America, mm -hmm. the debates, the hot-button issues, and so many things that people talk about. If he just accepted the Bible as the word of God, that would be the end of the debate. Y'all missing a good place? Amen. <laughs> to jump in right there. I mean, there's a lot of talk of politics and everything else. Well, we ought to get back to talking about the fact that we need the word of God and we need the God of the word. Can you say amen? amen? We need God's word to be able to overshadow our lives in such a way that we are reminded that a lot of these things were already settled. Just because people stirred these up in politics and started debating them and wondering what's right and wrong, I mean, it doesn't change the Bible. God gives us right and wrong right there in the Scripture. Isn't that true? I'd like to end some debates tonight, wouldn't you? I'd like to see some arguments come to an end. So I said, well, people interpret it one way and other people interpret it another. Well, we need to be careful because the Bible says that the Scriptures have no private interpretation. Mm -hmm. 
There's some things, you know, that just didn't need further commentary. How many of somebody said, well, some that's hard to understand. There is some things hard to understand. Even the Apostle Peter agreed with that and said, some of the things that Paul the Apostle says are hard to be understood. But he also referred to what Paul said as the scriptures, because he said, like other scriptures, let us know that he knew that what Paul wrote was the Bible. I mean, if Peter knew that, and he said that, he said some things are hard to be understood, but I mean, oh, brethren, there are some things we'd have to have a help to, to misunderstand. <laughs> true. Isn't that true? <laughs> I've told you about Mark Twain. He said it wasn't the things he didn't understand in the Bible that bothered him. It was the things he did understand. <laughs> <laughs> what we understand is, brethren, there's one day coming when people are going to stand before a holy God. Now, our God is a just God. The Jesus of Nazareth, the Savior, is also going to judge the quick and the dead, the Bible says. Those that are alive and those that are dead are all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. All the way back there in the nation of Israel, God let them have revelation. It was a dark time in some ways. It was the ancient world, but the glory of God still filled the house. Can you say amen? amen. God's power came in in 2 Chronicles 5. The Bible says when they began to worship and came together, worshiping together as one, you remember what we read last week in the latter part of chapter 5? It says, verse 13, and it came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his mercy endured forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. So that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. I tell you, if God's glory filled the house of the Lord way back then, uh, brother, that's not a sign that it can't be happening anymore. I mean, brother, that's a good sign. If he can do it then, how much more will he do for blood-washed believers? Can you say amen? These here, they're just offering up animals and sacrifices. They're in there uh, carrying out that Old Testament temple worship. But even they experienced the glory of God, so much so that the Bible says the priest couldn't even stand to minister. I mean, oh, that was a heavy presence. Isn't that right? That was a marvelous move. If God can do that while people are offering up animal sacrifices, are you out there? <laughs> If God could do that when they came together and started singing and worshiping together and came together as one, what would happen today? Amen. As a matter of fact, he's teaching them in this passage in Chronicles we're reading that if it ever gets to a time when the presence of the glory of God is not coming in like that, that they are to come together and begin to repent of their sins, to look toward Jerusalem, look toward the temple. Oftentimes when they pray, they would look toward the temple. But they're taught to come back and repent uh, concerning the things that they've done so that the presence of God would overshadow them once more. And that's what I hope we will take away from this. We said that on Wednesday nights we want to look into those things. It will be a blessing to our church to be able to see revival and renewal in our church and in our community. Uh, somebody said, well, I'll tell you what's wrong with the church. They don't like young people. Then if somebody else says, I'll tell you what about the church. They don't do right by this or that. And there could be issues and things that need to be dealt with. But the main thing that was going on with the nation of Israel is that they would often forget God. Isn't that right? It wasn't just about some of these other things. It was about the fact that they were getting away from the Lord. Look at the latter part of chapter 7. You'll see what I'm talking about. As I said, we'll be making reference to all three of these chapters. Notice what he says. Verse 20. Then will I pluck them up by the roots out of the land which I have given them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name will I cast out of my sight, and will make it be a proverb and a word among all nations. And this house which is high shall be an astonishment to everyone that passeth by it, so that he shall say, Why doth the Lord, why hath the Lord done this unto the land and unto this house? And it shall be answered. Here's the answer right here. It shall be answered because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them forth out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore hath he brought all this evil upon them. This is the problem. And in America, we can say, well, we don't have all the right programs. We don't have enough music. We don't have enough, uh, you know, uh, whatever you can think of. You know, the, most churches now got to have a record ball court and they got to have a chef on staff to be able to keep the food going like it's supposed to be. You know, people are catering and catering and catering to everybody they can, every way they can. Got to have the exact right song, right music, got to sing sounds. It's got to sound like the studio version of any song. Isn't that true? 
And people tell us all the things you got to have for a church to be able to grow and for things to work out. But I'm here to tell you the primary problem in America is, is people have forsook God, they have forgot about him and gone away and got involved in idolatry. He says this is answer. So when he asks, why is it looking like this? Why does these things happen to this house? So he's looking to a future time. And of course the time came when a lot of things happened to the temple, ultimately completely destroyed. And he says this should be answered because they forsook the Lord. We've got the answer. Amen. 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 We know what the real trouble is. Can you say amen? Right. It's not that we're not entertaining enough. It's not that we can't, you know, it, there's so much emphasis that's put on the arts within the church, you know, that we've got to have all the music, all the drama, we've got to have all the pageantry, and then they say, well, we can get a few hundred people together and hold them together, possibly, if we can, you know, have a, a mixture of everything from, uh, you know, whatever that they're, <laughs> they're doing from Hollywood to wherever else. But I mean, brother, none of those things are going to be able to uh, substitute for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Uh, none of those things. Now, you know, God can certainly use music. We see him using it right there in that chapter. It could be an immense blessing. God can use dramas and things. I've been blessed by all those things. But first, you got to have his presence. Can you see? Yes. Amen. Amen. And that's what Solomon put such value on, uh, that he brought the symbolic presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant. He brought that symbol in to start with to say uh, that uh, we're making a prior priority out of this because it, that... Uh, Ark of the Covenant had been out there in that tent that David had put it in long before that. But they moved that Ark of the Covenant out of that tent into that temple uh, to send a message to everybody in Israel that here we value the presence of God. The glory came down, filled the place. Can you say amen? Yes. Well, you'll notice we read the chapter, of course, chapter 6, verse 1. We'll begin our lesson tonight. The Bible says, then said Solomon, the Lord has said he would dwell in thick darkness. Now, why in the world would he talk about darkness after he just got talking about, got in talking about how that the glory filled the house of God? This is a mystery, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the mystery is, of course, is that uh, God would refer to himself as dwelling in thick darkness, but it's actually a protection for the people. You notice he says, but I have built a house of habitation for thee and a place for, uh, for thy dwelling forever. And what he's doing is connecting Sinai to what's happening at the temple. We know what the Sinai experience was. There was the greatest new convert class any group of people ever had as they came out of Egypt. And now they're out there newly redeemed from Egypt, standing at the foot of Sinai. I mean, of these people that have just been delivered out of pagan Egypt is going to have to have the presence of God impressed upon their lives in a mighty way because they're going to be wandering out there in the wilderness of course, it was God's will for them to go right on into the promised land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But these folks are going to have to have something that marks their thinking, that touches their lives, that helps them be separated from the other nations around about them. He said, you're going to be a unique nation, a peculiar nation. You're going to be a different kind of people. Hello? Mm -hmm. I mean, brother, what makes us different is the presence of God. Yes, amen. All the laws and rules you could come up with is not enough to be able to hold you in a place where you're going to be different and peculiar. Mm -hmm. What's going to make the difference is the presence of God. Your knowledge of God's presence, your experience with the deep and marvelous move of the Spirit of God in your life is what's going to cause you to be different. Isn't that true? Amen. In many ways, he gave them the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, to travel with them to give them a perpetual Sinai experience. They were there for a year down there at the foot of Sinai, but when they get ready to move, how's this going to work? Well, God said, I'm going to give you the tabernacle. Of course, the Bible says that Moses had the tabernacle built, and it was finished. Mm -hmm. And when it was finished, the Bible says that the glory of God came into the tabernacle with Moses so much so that he could not stand to minister. Mm -hmm. He had stood up in the darkness on the mountain, and of course, they tried to keep people back from the mountain, and the reason that God did that in darkness is because the, the Bible says that God dwells in a light that man cannot approach unto. If they had seen the full light and glory of God, they would have not made it. And you and I wouldn't make it either. Amen. Hello. The Bible says that there is a light uh, that you cannot approach unto. Exodus 19.9 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. So the emphasis was not on what they saw, 
but it was on what they heard. Yes. God wanted them to hear the word of the Lord out of uh, that dark cloud. <laughs> the darkness is there really to protect them. As a matter of fact, they put things around to try to make it where nobody could touch the mountain because he said, if anybody touches the mountain on Mount Sinai, they're going to die. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. The Bible says Moses, being the man of God that he was, he did exceedingly fear and quake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know this kind of a sight like it was on Sinai is the kind of thing that make anybody <laughs> be fearful. But then the Bible says, God gave them the tabernacle. His presence filled the tabernacle in such a way that it actually, the presence of God in the tabernacle was even greater than that which was on Mount Sinai. When Stephen was preaching to those that were before him when he witnessed, he called it the tabernacle of witness. God gave himself a witness in the midst of the camp of Israel. We talked about it last week, how they had fired their camp by night, a cloud by day, the glory of God was coming up out of that tabernacle and there was just no doubt about it. They could look at that if they wanted to, 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was to mark their thinking forever, that you're not serving a dead God. You know, there's a lot of other nations that were serving all kinds of idols, and other nations were carrying boxes around on their shoulders, too. You may not realize it, but there were other tribes that were carrying things around on their shoulders and all that. But uh, here they had was an empty box, really, when it came to being... Uh, just a, a dead God. They didn't really have anything. Mm -hmm. But the children of Israel, they've got the Ark of the Covenant out there, but then the glory of God is shooting up off of that Ark up into the sky, creating a cloud over three million people, giving them air conditioning in the daytime and heat and light in the night. <laughs> this is a God who meets all the needs of an entire nation of people yes. and protects them even when it comes to his own uh, holiness and his own glory because if they were to come too close, then they would be stoned. The Bible says, Hebrews 12, verse 20, for they could not endure that which was commanded. If so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with the dark. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Mm -hmm. Now Solomon is connecting Sinai to the temple, letting people know God is not just another neighbor here that's moving into town that we can just become irreverent and just talk and do any way we want to do. This is the God of Sinai that has moved into the temple. Can you say that? Mm -hmm. This is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses. And he calls some of these names. Calls Moses' name several times. Calls his dad's name several times. This is the God that made a covenant with my dad. This is the God that made the covenant with David. Caused David to be able to have the victories uh, that he had. And so Solomon is connecting all of that. So these people have no misunderstanding about the fact uh, that the reverence of God is a very important part of what their lives will be from that point on. Amen. There's a number of other scriptures, many other scriptures in here that talk about this idea of darkness and all that concerning God. It says Psalm 18, 9 through 11, he bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet and he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. The thing was, as I mentioned to you, he had a message for them. It was more about what they heard. It was the word of God Amen. that he wanted to get across to them. And of course, uh, here in Chronicles, what we see is that Solomon, uh, now having finished the temple, remember Moses finished the ark, Solomon now has finished the temple. Can you say amen? Our own Lord and Savior fulfilled all of these uh, various types and shadows that you can think of. Uh, there's a type and shadow here with the sacrifices, with the priest, and with the temple. And Jesus fulfilled all of these in his life and ministry. The Word of God says uh, that Christ <coughs> said that this temple, I will tear it down and build it again in three days. He's the high priest. And then also the Bible declares him to be the sacrifice, of course, he is uh, the sacrifice to end all of the sacrifices. Isn't that true? Amen. Uh, Christ is the priest, the temple, and the sacrifice. <laughs> Fulfilled it all and cried out, it is finished. Yes. I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. Mm -hmm. Brethren, thank God the presence of God is available to us now as believers. The glory of God that we see recorded in the Old Testament, the Bible says now, that God has taken up his habitation in the church. 
How reverent should we be? Because when we think about how reverent that they were called upon to be at Sinai and at the tabernacle and at the temple, think about the fact that the Bible says, now it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That the church grows together as a holy habitation under the Lord. Well, I'll tell you a fresh revelation of God's holiness and glory and power will cause you to want to be a, a, a peculiar people. Isn't that right? Amen. That's the impact that it had on them. As long as it was before them and they didn't forget, uh, they wanted to serve God in holiness. When they did, it made them a very peculiar people. Matter of fact, their joy was so great, their celebration was so fantastic, their worship. There was a time when they enjoyed such kingdom living as a matter of fact, they would begin worshiping sometimes, it says in Chronicles here and other places, that when the sacrifice was being offered, when the evening sacrifice was being offered, that they would stand from three to five hours sometimes, even out in the sunshine. And the Bible says, and all the congregation worshiped. Mm -hmm. Children, adults, everybody stood from three to five hours and glorified their God in, a, in the hot sunshine. Old Testament people. Hello? <laughs> if it had such an impact on their hearts and minds that they would glorify God in such a manner, what should happen in the church? Can you say amen? amen. That you and I now have been washed in the blood of Jesus. The Lord no longer has a, a temple for himself. The Bible, you know, a lot of people might say it this way, that God in the Old Testament chose a temple for his, for his people, but now he's chose the people for his temple. Mm -hmm. Amen. See, there's a wonderful correlation between the Old Testament and the New Testament. As you study it, it comes alive in you. You realize that it was God's desire all the time is to have it where his glory would be revealed in the lives of those who are redeemed. Can we say tonight, brethren, that we sense the presence of God in our lives, that the Spirit of the Lord has taken up residence on the inside of us? Amen. And thank God also there's a mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit available to those who will receive from Almighty God. Yes, you were born of the Spirit the moment you get born again, but that wasn't the end all. I mean, that was the beginning. That was a way to, to set you free. Now you can see into the kingdom. And the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? amen. Some people say, I got it all when I got saved, honey. <laughs> I don't know something about that. Just don't ring true to the scriptures when you realize everybody in the Bible, once they got saved, when we see the book of Acts, and other places in the New Testament, they begin to grow and they begin to uh, come along when it comes to their joy and their praise and their worship, their dedication to God. They certainly enjoyed a marvelous experience of being born again, but that wasn't the end. They followed the Lord to the upper room and received the mighty baptism of the Holy Ghost. Right. And they went out into the world and preached the gospel and they followed him and they followed him and they followed him wherever he directed. And their lives just became stronger in the things of God and they certainly were put under pressure sometimes persecuted and all sort of things but yet uh, we see their lives being fruitful and abounding in the things of God whether we can take I believe uh, some wonderful messages from this second chronicles it is the house of God first of all that word house mentioned so many times it's God's house it's not man's house man built it but God allowed them to be able to dedicate it to his glory even though while Solomon's praying, he said, Lord, I know we can't actually build you a house. Heaven is your throne, earth is your footstool. He acknowledges, Lord, we can't really build you a house. You're a God. <laughs> so it was the mercy and grace of God. That's what that house being dedicated to God is such a representation of as how glorious God's mercy and grace is to mankind. Then we make our feeble attempt. <laughs> And God says, I'll meet you at that place of sacrifice. I'll meet you at that place where that uh, you've been able to come together and you followed my direction to a certain degree. And he says, I, that's how my grace is revealed. And that's really what we should take from it. Some people think on the Old Testament law that there wasn't any grace under the Old Testament. But then, uh, this is a picture of God's amazing grace that you've got a people struggling <laughs> Failing, flawed, but he said, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That was a part of Solomon's prayer. He said, I will hear from heaven and heal their land. I think the word heaven is mentioned in these passages 14 times. Mm. I will hear from heaven. Amen. 
I tell you, if we would be willing to hear from heaven, uh, we'd have heaven to hear us. Can you say amen? Yes. And that's why we're preaching the word, because we believe when folks begin to conform to the scriptures, they can pray with so much more power and authority and expectation. Brethren, we're expecting God to move and bless here at Jacket and all across this area. We want every church blessed. Can you say amen? We're not just setting our faith just for us here at Jacket and believing for renewal and revival. But we're asking God to do it everywhere. I tell you, I want somebody to reach my loved ones. If I can't reach my loved ones, I want somebody else to be able to reach them. And if somebody else can't reach your loved ones, I hope that somebody else uh, can reach them somehow or another. But I know this, I want to see an old-time, old-fashioned, uh, heaven-born Mount Sinai gully washer. Can you say amen? And uh, it would be foolish for us to look at, at what happened to them and for us to turn around and think that, uh, that we can just go on and just do any way we want to and allow the world to have such major influence in our lives and still expect to have revival. Hello? Mm -hmm. And we cannot believe that, uh, that just catering to people is how that God orchestrated ministry. I mean, it ought to be about pleasing God. And obviously, we want to do right by people, of course, and be as loving as we know how to be, be as wise as we can about connecting with people and, and trying our best not to offend anybody unnecessarily. But brethren, I'm sure that if they come around to a church like ours, they're coming because they stand in need of a word from God. If they wanted the same old thing, they'd just sit at home and stay on the couch and stay where they were. Yeah. And so if they come out of their house and come over this way and come around us, or if you're able to see them out here somewhere and they're willing to ask you some questions, how I many know they're looking for some life? Yes. They're looking for a change. They're looking for something that'll lift them. Can you say amen? amen. Now, this is why it breaks our hearts sometimes to think about Israel having the living God like this and the glory cloud, you know, coming in there in such a way that the priest cannot even stand to minister. But the day comes whenever they begin to turn to that paganism. Even Solomon. That his testimony is it comes a time when his heart is turned away. That means, brethren, we need to be very careful, doesn't it? Amen. If the wisest man on the face of the earth can get wow. caught up in something. Wow. One fellow preached a message entitled Learn Lessons from Fools, and he referred to Solomon as one of those fools. <laughs> uh, I mean, somebody said, there's no fool like an old fool. <laughs> and Solomon, as he got older, he finally woke up, and we believe, we'd like to think he did, and said, you know, the, what a man ought to do is, is to remember the Creator in the days of his youth, and <laughs> he shouldn't let uh, the passing of time cause his heart to be turned away from God. Of course, we know that the Bible says it was all those concubines and wives he got from all those other countries that turned his heart from the Lord. Mm -hmm. Brethren, it's time for the church to wake up. It's time for Christians People to wake up all across America. We can look and see the divine blueprint for revival. Here is the house of revival. God said, I'm, I'm going to allow this house to stand as my name. I'm going to put my name in it and my promise and my covenant so that whatever happens to you, as long as that house is there, he says, you know, you can call upon me and I will answer to you if you will turn away from sin and forsake uh, the heathenism and the idolatry that, uh, that you have embraced. God has given himself witness that it's the house of testimony, which means that God is testifying his word to his people. The house of uh, Solomon, the temple that was built, of course, would be a place where the word of God was to be exalted. I've certainly been influenced greatly by several different authors, ones I've read after through the years and studied and taught out of their textbooks and what have you, but none of that means anything, of course, if it's not founded on scripture, but I've been blessed to be taken through these scriptures and look at these and be reminded uh, just how it is that God dealt with his people. And he certainly dealt with them in a very merciful way. If you just take out a couple of uh, passages of scripture and don't interpret it in balance, you think, Lord, he was really rough on those Israelites. And it did come a time when he shut them down, hauled them away and carried them away captive. But brethren, it went out until after they had seen the fullness of kingdom living under the Old Testament. God will not judge till first he's revealed himself and look what a mighty revelation of his power, his glory, and his word. And now that's why I think that we're starting to see some element of judgment in America. Now think about the kind of lives and blessings we've had upon our nation. Mm -hmm. God reveals himself and then he judges in the light of that revelation. Yes. Mm -hmm. We cry out tonight and we say, Lord, hold back your hand of judgment. Let us have revival one more time. Let us have uh, the beautiful move of the Holy Spirit. Let us see people still delivered. Yes. 
Uh, it's up to God on what he does with these things. But we're pleading the case for a modern generation, many times for our own children, some of you grandchildren, great-grandchildren. We're pleading the case saying, God, uh, we don't want to see it go this way. We're pleading the case before God. Uh, we're praying much like the way in which Solomon said we should pray. We said, Lord, if there's anything in our lives that would make a difference, anything that we would need to do to turn away from it, uh, to be able to cause us to be able to have revival. I tell you, I'm to a place I'm ready for whatever. Uh, that if whatever the Lord said to me, I'd be wanting to make that adjustment. Isn't that right? I want to make that change. You'll notice that Solomon began to worship God and praise Him as he's dedicating the temple here. We'll close with this in a moment here, but you'll notice it says in verse 13 that he built a brazen scaffold, uh, evidently brass type of material that he used for the scaffold, five cubits long, five cubits broad, three cubits high, and set it in the midst of the court. And upon it he stood and kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. You know, sometimes we tell folks to pray. We tell them, you know, to eyes closed, heads bowed and all that, you know. But that was foreign to the children of Israel. They lifted their heads up toward heaven, opened up their eyes, opened up their hands and looked up to God as if my hands are empty now, God, uh, that, uh, you know, if you don't bless us, we're not going to get blessed. <laughs> and here's the king of the whole nation. Bows down in front of all of them on his knees. Calls upon God and he says, And said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven or in the earth, which keepeth covenant and showeth mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. Thou which hast kept with thy servant David my father, that which thou hast promised him, and speakest with thy mouth, and hast fulfilled it with thine hand, as it is this day. This is his worship of God. He said, Lord, the things you said, you brought it to pass. That which you said to your mouth, you brought it forth with your hand. And in our worship tonight, brethren, we can say, glory to God, the things he said, he has brought it to pass. We can say this, there is no God like our God in heaven or in the earth, which keepeth covenant and showeth mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. Amen. This is our worship tonight. Can you say amen? amen. There's no God like ours. There's no God that keeps covenant and makes a covenant. There's no God like amen. ours that can speak it out and then bring it to pass. Yes. The whole Christian faith is built on this idea that our God is able to speak something out and then bring it to pass. Yes. Genesis 3.15, I'm going to send you the seed of the woman. He's going to be the Messiah. And you know what? He brought it to pass. Can you say amen? amen. And brethren, we believe if we call upon God tonight, he can still bring some things to pass, even in America. Yes. I just refuse to give up on our country uh, until the Lord were to tell me to. <laughs> in some ways, you know, it's got what he said to Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, you know, you'd be better off with the enemy than you would with <laughs> Israel. <too. laughs> but uh, that's a hard place to get to. You know, right? I wouldn't want to get to that place. And so we pray because in so many ways, we're praying for our family, an extended family. We're praying for people all over this nation, people that we've met and known, people we grew up with, went to school with, we're saying, God, have mercy. God, have mercy. God, have mercy on our nation. Have mercy on Washington. Have mercy on uh, those who are in office or whatever office it may be, whatever party that it is. Amen. We're more concerned about the spiritual welfare of our country than anything else. Amen. Amen. Thank God, brethren, tonight we can honor the Lord. We'll Thank stand together tonight and worship the Lord as we...